Thanks so much, Mark. I, I'm really humbled to have been able to spend my life working for a cure for, for epilepsy. Uh, those of you who have epilepsy, those of you who work for those who have epilepsy, those of you who raise money for those who have epilepsy, those of you who donate money to the cause of epilepsy, you are my heroes. What I'm gonna to try to do in the next few moments is to talk about some of the exciting things that are on the horizon with regard to treatments and cures for epilepsy. And I think you're all aware that we're in a period of accelerating scientific research devoted to the study of epilepsy. And this is really bringing enormous new opportunities for treatments that will improve the quality of life for children and adults with epilepsy. But to understand the future of epilepsy therapy, we need to take a moment to recall the past. There have always been people with epilepsy. Since the dawn of time, epilepsy has affected millions of people. Historians have uncovered evidence that epilepsy was recorded in hieroglyphic texts dating back 3,000 years. Ancient people thought that seizures were caused by evil spirits or demons that invaded a person's body. Priests attempted to cure people with epilepsy by driving the demons out of them with magic and prayers. This superstition was challenged by ancient physicians like Hippocrates in Greece and the fifth century BC practitioners of Indian medicine called Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, these folks recognized the seizure as a dysfunction of the brain and not a supernatural event. And by the time of Galen in 200 AD, various types of seizures were recognized, including those with loss of consciousness and amnesia for the seizure. Galen also recognized auras as warning signs for seizures. This is a very old disease and we've been studying it uh, for a long time. Nevertheless, superstitions have persisted for centuries and attitudes of past societies toward epilepsy have le left a legacy of stigma and damaging misconceptions which still persist today. Although epilepsy presents a challenge for many people with um, exceptional create, there are many people with exceptional creativity and unusual leadership abilities who have achieved greatness in the arts and science. And uh, some of those are shown on this slide. You'll see Socrates, Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Isaac Newton, all of these people had epilepsy, Dostoevsky, some more familiar people to our time, Prince, Elton John, the Beastie Boy, Ad Rock, Neil Young, and even Chief Justice Roberts. All of these people had epilepsy, and of course, they excelled uh, in what they did. Now, Hippocrates is said to have written, it is not to be imagined that he should know the remedy of diseases who knows not their original causes. And today, scientists are focusing on the brain mechanisms of epilepsy from many different uh, perspectives. Uh, just last year, with the help of uh, Susan, uh, we published a book called Basic Mechanisms of the Epilepsy. Susan helped us in her spare time while she was uh, running the uh, Epilepsy uh, Society here in Southern California. She's a remarkable person. She told me not to say anything about her, but that was just a reason why I had to <laughs> congratulate her for this event and for all of the work we, she's done for us. Thank you, Susan. She helped us put together 100 chapters describing every aspect of epilepsy from development of the brain to the physiology of seizures to genetics. But even as late as the 1960s, when I was a boy, and I actually grew up here in Los Angeles, not too far from UCLA, in those days, which weren't that long ago, we had very little understanding about the causes of epilepsy. This image from William G. Lennox, the great epilepsy physician at Harvard from the 1930s to the 1960s, uh, and Lennox has been called the father of the fight against epilepsy, uh, and he established the seizure unit at Boston Children's 
It's considered the predecessor of the modern children's epilepsy center. Uh, we hold him in great renown in the epilepsy community. Uh, he was tortured and desperate to know the root cause of epilepsy. However, he could only speculate because so little was known. And this was his conception of what epilepsy is all about. He conceived of epilepsy as a reservoir with a genetic watershed and independent streams of contributing environmental and other factors, including brain lesions and disorders of bodily function. If you look at the uh, diagram, you'll see that periodically the reservoir could overflow on the left side, and this was representing a seizure. And when anti-epileptic drugs or drugs to treat epilepsy were administered to the patient, this built the bank up higher. So this was the understanding of epilepsy that we had uh, when I was beginning my medical training. Now Lennox, he realized the limitations of this understanding and he called for more research. And research during the last 50 years has truly transformed our, our understanding. An important key to our current understanding comes from genetics. Genetic factors are thought to be a cause in about 40% of cases of uh, epilepsy. Genetic epilepsies can be caused by a single gene, a complex interplay of multiple genes that confer epilepsy susceptibility, or through chromosomal disorders. Now, the cases where only a single gene contributes to the epilepsy are very rare, only about 1% of cases. However, these epilepsies have been extremely important uh, to our understanding of seizures and epilepsy, and they've transformed uh, our understanding. Most of the genes that have been found are ion channels. You can see an image of one of these ion channels on the screen before you. This is an enormously complex molecular machine. I had the honor of moderating a symposium at the annual meeting of the American Epilepsy Society in 1997 when the first ion channel linked to an idiopathic generalized epilepsy was described. This was a new potassium channel called KCNQ2, and it was found to be mutated in newborns uh, with a form of epilepsy called benign familial neonatal convulsions. We now know that mutations in many other ion channels can cause epilepsy as well. And it turns out that non-ion channel genes can also be associated with epilepsy. For example, uh, EFHC1, also known as myoclonin, EF hand domain containing protein 1. There'll be a test at the end of the uh, lecture today. Uh, th this gene was found by Dr. Antonio Delgado Esqueda, an epilepsy researcher at the Veterans Hospital at UCLA. Dr. Esquade and his collaborators found this gene to be the cause of one of the causes of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Last year, GLUT1, a glucose transporter, was associated with absence epilepsy and myoclonic astatic epilepsy. Uh, the genetic defect causes the failure of glucose transport across the blood-brain barrier, essentially starving the brain of energy. Now, the identification of this genetic error has been enormously important in uh, thinking about treatments. We've known for a long time that the ketogenic diet can be beneficial for treating epilepsy. Uh, it's predominantly used in children, although it does work in, in adults if they stay on the diet. Uh, but it turns out that for the GLUT1 deficiency disorder, uh, the ketogenic diet is essentially just what the doctor ordered because it provides ketone bodies to the brain, which is an alternative source of energy, allowing uh, the brain to bypass uh, the need for glucose uh, and uh, to metabolize uh, ketone bodies. And we have known for some time that the ketogenic diet is effective in seizure control, uh, and uh, in this particular condition, it may also lead to improved cognitive outcomes. So this is a really important advance uh, that comes from uh, the type of research uh, that you are supporting. In addition to ion channel and transporter defects, miswiring of connections uh, can also cause epilepsy, and we're working on strategies to try to correct that. Uh, but 
in addition to dietary therapies, and you heard about surgery earlier, uh, we all know that drug treatment is the major way that most patients with epilepsy are treated. Unfortunately, drug treatments don't work in every case of epilepsy, uh, but they do work for many patients and they produce remarkable uh, improvements. So let's talk about drug treatments for just a second. This graph shows the accelerating pace of development uh, of new epilepsy drugs. When I was in training, there were two or three drugs that were available, and they all had pretty lousy side effects. In the last two decades, you can see that there's been an acceleration of new drugs, many of which are better tolerated. And they, at the top of the graph, I, 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 I change this graph every time we get a new drug, and you can see that the, the, the drug at the top there, it's called parampinol, goes beyond the, the uh, y-axis there, uh, because this one was uh, just developed in the last few years, and the FDA is currently uh, assessing the data and will uh, determine uh, whether the uh, uh, drug uh, needs to be scheduled, and at that point, it's gonna be available for, for treatment, and we'll see how it, how it works for patients with epilepsy. Uh, this drug was developed according to uh, new strategies for drug discovery that are being used throughout medicine. Uh, it was developed uh, using what's called high-throughput screening with a robot uh, that performed thousands and thousands of assays tirelessly 24-7 throughout the days and, and even on the weekends, and ultimately... Uh, this new drug was uh, discovered. So with these technologies, you can see uh, that there are going to be important new drugs coming online uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, we also uh, have many exciting new uh, devices for epilepsy. The vagal nerve stimulator has been available for some time, as you're all aware. Uh, this is a new device that is currently being evaluated by the FDA as we speak. Uh, it's called the Responsive Neurostimulator Device, and it's an uh, absolutely remarkable piece of engineering, as complex as the iPhone uh, in your pocket. Uh, it detects uh, the abnormal electrical activity of epilepsy and then stimulates the region of the brain that's causing the problem, uh, hopefully terminating the seizures. And we'll see if the FDA and their analysis of the data uh, determines that the device is sufficiently safe uh, and effective uh, for uh, use by patients. Uh, one of the approaches that we're using uh, in my laboratory uh, is called convection enhanced delivery, uh, and we are developing treatments that allow putting very small amounts of, of uh, medicinal uh, substances into the brain uh, to try to stop seizures and thus avoid uh, epilepsy surgery. Uh, you heard earlier about cell and gene transplantation. This is a very active uh, area of research. Uh, with investigators uh, all over the country and around the world uh, trying to develop approaches using stem cell technologies uh, that would allow uh, the uh, stem cells to be implanted into an epileptic brain region, uh, causing an elimination of seizures and essentially curing uh, uh, the epilepsy. Uh, gene therapy is another approach that uh, uh, will, uh, in the future, allow us to correct genetic uh, defects. So that's just a very quick uh, overview of what's happening. It's very exciting for me to be involved uh, in this uh, field. Uh, I'm humbled uh, to, uh, to be with you uh, uh, today and share these uh, new developments uh, with you. Uh, our goal in epilepsy therapy, as always, is no seizures uh, and no side effects. That's what we're working toward, and we're really grateful uh, to the support you provide uh, for this uh, very important uh, activity. Thank you.